So, dear colleagues, welcome everyone to this sponsored session by Cardiac Dimensions, which is entitled, Is Only Fixing Functional Mitral Regurgitation in Heart Failure Patients Enough? I'm Philipp Lurz and I will moderate this session together with Michael Jona. We have a fantastic panel and speakers, Nicole Karam, Daniel Folani and Stefan von Badeleven. The learning objectives of this session is to learn about combo therapy with the Carillon device for functional mitral regurgitation, see what we have in the literature in terms of body of evidence for the procedure, but also learn and discuss the potential benefits of earlier treatment in patients with functional mitral regurgitation. And with that, I would like to hand over to Michael. So uh, also from my uh, end, um, a warm welcome. Uh, we would like to encourage you to really interact with us and help us learn together with you. So please um, use your app, um, the microphones that are distributed throughout uh, this arena. And I would like to start and introduce the first speaker, um, who will be nobody less than Stefan von Badeleben, and talk about compotherapy with Carolyn. Michael, Philip, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's my pleasure uh, to open up this session with heart failure treatment and analplasty beyond uh, pure mitral regurgitation treatment, the perspective, I must say, of combo therapy. These are my disclosures. Heart failure with secondary MR has a distinct uh, analysis situation now uh, with a Jack heart failure publication in 2021 um, presenting a meta-analysis actually of three randomized trials in this perspective. And as you can see here, there has been a follow-up situation of 12 months in these three trials, but of course the numbers themselves are relatively modest. So you can see we have a number at risk at baseline of 67, a control group with 28 patients. But what we can see in this situation that was partially SHEM controlled, so uh, the uh, guideline-directed medical therapy um, involved also a SHEM operation procedure, as did uh, the Carillion intervention. And we can see on the left lower side, actually, that we saw remodeling in these patients and that this is more pronounced uh, in the analoplasty or device group. We can see that this effect um, intensifies over time, and this has been seen in the early Titan experience in the early trials with the device. So it's a very elastic component. It's an indirect analplasty, uh, which uses the coronary sinus, uh, which has a distinct distance between two millimeters without so sometimes eight millimeters from the true hinge points. And this elastic components intensifies uh, the remodeling effect over time, uh, and this is nicely shown in these graphs. If we look, take a deep dive uh, into the parameters, we see that the control group got an intensification of the elevation of biomarkers, while there was a mild decrease in the device group. You can also see that there was an effect on LA volume, as well as end diastolic and end systolic volumes, you can see that the uh, improvement situation was more pronounced in the device group with a sham control, and that there was a change in mitral valve diameter being most pronounced in the AP direction and almost non-significant in the intercommissural direction. So this is an effect of the partial ring situation that we have with the natural anatomy of a coronary sinus device, which is always restricted to this natural anatomy. If we now look into the perspective, analplasty has the theoretical improvement that it is, can be a staged or simultaneous procedure. So it can be interconnected with a lot of other leaflet repair devices, namely the harpoon, which is no further available, but also the neocord device, as we see here. It can be staged or simultaneously with leaflet repair by edge to edge devices, like the latest generation MitraClip or Pascal. And it also opens the field for a secondary involvement with a replacement technique, and it has successfully done with a Tendine device or with Intrapid, which is on trials only. All other devices actually are CE mark. 
In the surgical history, we know the rationale for doing analplasty in combination with cordal replacement. And this is given on the left-hand side. And you can see this interaction being put to a transcatheter method here by using the Carillion analoplasty in order to improve leaflet distance versus hinge point distance. In addition here, with a transapical uh, variant of a cordal replacement in the beating heart model, which is the DS1000 neocord system. And we published these two approaches beginning in the year 2017 and 2018, both on the mitral and on the tricuspid uh, annular reduction on the right-hand side seen with a cardioband direct analplasty plus uh, a clip therapy or a pure leaflet therapy, as you see in the 2017 publication, the European Heart Journal. So to take a deeper dive look into the Carillion device, it's a um, crimped device which will place a distal anchor next to the insertion of the great uh, coronary vein into the coronary sinus, and it uses a proximal anchors. Both anchors will be oversized by a factor of two uh, to the natural anatomy, and by um, selecting the length of the device versus the calculated length of the coronary sinus, you typically uh, foreshorten the coronary sinus by four to five centimeters. And uh, this can be done on purpose and in the cath lab itself, but you can also use CT measurements in order uh, to get your final length. And just to illustrate this, uh, we have the cartoon on the left-hand side. I did this in the middle in the in vitro model on a deer heart, so a real heart in a pumping uh, in vitro model. And you can see that just by pulling on the coronary sinus, you can adapt both leaflets here uh, very nicely and close the gap. And on the human heart, this is shown from Professor Lutz from Lübeck, uh, also in the human situation while the system is still attached. And this foreshortening will then be uh, secured by the proximal anchor in the system. So the combo therapy rationale in the years 2017 to 2022, uh, when we did this investigation, was uh, to adopt, actually, and to reduce the distance from the anterior leaflet to the posterior leaflet and to enable uh, two distinct leaflet therapy models, which is a cordal repair and also a leaflet edge-to-edge -edge repair. And uh, we published this last year uh, and showed a reverse cardiac remodeling in those patients undergoing a combination therapy, which is standard of care in the surgical world, but which is not yet standard of care, of course, in the interventional world. And this is shown here. As you can see here on the right upper side, marked in red, is the combination with the Carillion device. On the left-hand side is the combination with the cardioband, which is a no longer available on the mitral field, direct analplasty system, and the combination of which. And you can see that these were elderly patients with the combination therapy and complete follow-up in the age group of 77 and 79 years. You can see they were predominantly in class three and four, had an elevated logistic Euroscore and Euroscore two, which gave them a prohibitive hint, which is 4.8 and 3.8 uh, as a Euroscore two. Atrial fibrillation was very pronounced. If you normally look into mitral valve cohorts, you will have atrial fibrillation rates of 60%. You can appreciate that these patients were relatively dilated, especially in their uh, atrium, and they had 86% atrial fibrillation rate, a high number of previous PCI, previous cabbage, and also pacemaker leads. The adherence to standard guideline-directed medical therapy was relatively high. It was higher than the co-op group, being 86 to 100 percent. And you can see that a distinct number here of 26 and 7 patients were done in combination with this coronary sinus system, which is labeled as CMCS uh, in this publication. So the combo therapy options, as you see here, also showed a very elevated LAV index. So it's a LAVI, which is LA volume index. And the cutoff for being normal would be 34 cc per meter square. And you can appreciate that 50 cc per meter square is a highly dilated uh, atrium. You can see the majority of patients were in secondary MR, uh, being approximately three-fourths of the patient population. One-fourth of the patient population was primary MR. And those patients were selected not to have massive or torrential TR 
but we're in TR grades one, two, and three in a five grade scale, according to the Becky Hahn and Pip Samarano classification published in 2018. Here you can see the results. You see an improvement in the New York Heart Association crate in this uh, smaller cohort, as you can see. And you can also see in this example uh, a reduction in the diameters, which is especially true on the right-hand side, which gives you the AP diameter, uh, and also the survival curves here for five years follow-up in this patient cohort. We could also demonstrate, like in the three randomized controlled trials, that with the combination therapy, there were reductions in LV and systolic diameter, LV and diastolic diameter, and also some reductions in LAVI. There was not a distinct change uh, in the biomarkers. You can see that they were reduced, but of course with this small number of patients just being above 33, um, it was not uh, possible to demonstrate uh, a distinct change as you see in the paired analysis. So my conclusions for this combo therapy that surgical evidence supports combo therapies in primary MR and with limited experience and evidence, annuloplasty and subvalvular surgery also in secondary MR. Analoplasty alone shows favorable remodeling effect in a patient cohort randomized control trial series with SHEM control, which is the reduced FMR, a three randomized meta-analysis that was published in Jack Heart Failure in 2021, and in this combo in single arm publication that was published in Frontiers in Cardiovascular Medicine in 2022. The majority of subjects experienced a reduction in MR severity, functional benefit, and remodeling at one year. Mortality benefits were not demonstrated. Combo therapy was initiated in a very selected patient cohort with more severe left heart failure and dilatation, especially of the atrium. And current combo therapy evidence is limited in size, but evidence provides hypothesis building data to support further research and clinical evaluation. And it's, of course, always challenged by reimbursement issues and further device iterations of all components. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Stefan. So uh, y you see, after all the discussions about T and replacement, we finally also talk about analoplasty, which is one of the main mechanisms in functional MR. So I think this is important. Um, I hope that we have questions from the audience. But before we go, there, just one, one quick question to Stefan. Combo therapy, what's, what's normally be done first? Well, you can always start with analoplasty, to be honest, because that's also the surgical approach to approximately leaflets, because your therapy of leaflet therapy will be influenced by the distance, of course, of your leaflets. So this is especially true if you use devices that have a shorter arm length. Of course, now we have a variety of different tier devices. So um, the use model was a little bit more initiated by the smaller nine millimeter arm length of previous uh, generations. But with a gap that's pre-existing, you can, of course, approximate the leaflets. You can relieve leaflet stress uh, by the closing of the tier devices and also with the indirect analoplasty imaging is not impaired as we have very little metal uh, in the coronary sinus and this is a distinct advantage of this uh, combination and, and in primary it's leaflet caudal repair uh, that may be the sweet spot for something like this. Mm -hmm. Also when you start with analoplasty then you might don't have to do anything else yeah. Yeah. if the result is um, exactly. sufficient. Yeah. Michael. So. Um, can you hear me? I hope it's working out. Um, there are two questions. The one is an easy one. Do you need to use contrast for this procedure to cannulate the coronary sinus? Yeah, you use contrast in these procedures. Uh, there's very little contrast. If you're experienced, you use a subset of a sheath and uh, also a tapered, tapered multipurpose catheter uh, and a teruma wire to enter actually the coronary sinus. You then advance. You have to check uh, your coronary arteries, especially the circumflex coronary artery, because you may be crossing this uh, with the CS, and this is very important in order to prevent uh, any ischemia situation or infarction of those patients. The rate is approximately 5%, so somewhere between 3 and 8% that where you may have coronary, um, coronary stenosis by, by implanting the device, so this has to be excluded. Yeah, wonderful, and I think we'll see some example. And uh, second question um, is perfectly suited for you. Who is the candidate for annular plastia? not tear. 
Yeah, so I think if you have normal leaflets and you have a pure dilatation of the annulus, so you're going beyond four centimeters annular size, for instance, you have an atrial component, actually, not severe tethering of the posterior leaflet. I think those candidates can also have excellent results with annular plasty alone. Yep. Maybe we can ask the audience something. Um, and the question is, do you think that in the field of structural heart disease, do we need sham control trials in general? So um, maybe if you could just raise your hands, those who think that sham control trials is something we should, we, we should try to design and actually conduct, or whether you think that that's no need. So please ha um, raise your hands if you think sham control trials are missing in the field. Okay, then I let's see the the other way around. Who thinks that we don't need it because um, f either the body of evidence is anyway good enough, or because it can never be done? Please raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, then maybe we go to the to Unicol and and um, listen to your talk. Here's something about the evidence we have, and then we could repeat it. So, hello, everyone. So, I will be presenting the Empower trial, which is which going to assess a bit of when to treat the mitral regurgitation. We'll see how. So, if you look at the course of what's happening with secondary mitral regurgitation, initially we have patients with uh, right ventri left ventricular dysfunction, and those patients are going to be put on medical treatment. That's the that's quite intuitive. We know that there are some challenges, there are some side effects, and there is a problem with adherence, but this is how it goes. And in some part, those patients are going to get to the point when MR is going to become more severe, MR three plus or more, and here we'll continue medical treatment and we'll start considering intervention for MR. And here, the biggest challenge is when should we do that? When is it time to start thinking about the intervention for mitral regurgitation? We've seen co-opt and we've seen metrifar and we've seen that there are patients that are beyond therapy and there are patients who are who will just benefit and have imp improved mortality. And the entire question is how not to miss the optimal time. Now, if we look about the pathophysiology of mitral regurgitation and heart failure, once we have a cardiomyopathy, we will have left ventricular dilation and remodeling, and this will lead to mitral regurgitation. But mitral regurgitation, per se, will cause an increase in the LV diameter, so we'll have more dilation and more aggravated cardiomyopathy. And similarly, mitral regurgitation will lead to LA enlargement, and again, atrial fibrillation, and again, we will get to a sort of vicious circle when they have the dilated cardiomyopathy leading to mitral regurgitation and mitral regurgitation further aggravating the cardiomyopathy. And this vicious circle, the question is, when can we stop it and when should we stop it? The price is going to be paid by, paid by the patient. As long as the disease course is going to progress, the patient, some of them will have mitral regurgitation, a big part of them will have mitral regurgitation, and their quality of life, their mortality will, will decrease, mortality will increase, and therefore it's very important to know why to intervene, when to intervene. So this is the, the objective of Empowered Trial that will want to assess in patients with large ventricles and functional or secondary MR, whether we could start with indirect annuloplasty using a carillon device very early in the time course. So for those, for those who are not familiar with the device, even though we've seen some slides from Stefan, so this is a, trans, a transjugular system. This is indirect uh, annuloplasty going through the coronary sinus. It has some advantages in, time, uh, in terms of safety. We don't have a transeptal puncture. We are going through a transjugular. Conscious sedation is possible even with the sham procedure, procedure. You don't necessarily need TE. Personally, I never use TE for that. So, and it's recaptural, so you can take a look at what's happening. And if you, need, if you see the impingement of the circumflex at the beginning, at least, you can still withdraw. So. This was a quick, a quick uh, glimpse, a glimpse, but we will see more in the next presentation. So the empowered trial, in few words, will allow patients at a really, this is 
a bit game changing, but it's also a bit uh, courageous to do that because the patients who are going to be included might have a one pl even a one plus mitral regurgitation as long as the LV is dilated. It doesn't prohibit any further uh, alternative therapies. If by with the time course of the disease, patients need more, they can have more. Directed uh, device treatment is going to be com compared. I mean, the idea is not to stop the treatment of the patients, but I mean, it will be introduced very early in the time course again. There is the central review committee, and it is sham control. Personally, to answer, answer the question, I do believe we need sham control. I mean, we, we saw to, to eliminate, we're wondering whether it was placebo effect, and I guess sham control can help us get rid of this. So. The idea is to present a study that is rather a heart failure study than a mitral regurgitation study, because if you look at the criteria, symptoms, LV dysfunction, but only 50%, but LV dilation, and heart failure hospitalization, and this is very important. In this slide, we can see patients, where what we care about is the blue and gray, and those patients have, have reduced ejection fraction between 40 or 50 or below 40, and those patients will have lots of events, whether about hospitalization, whether about mortality, 50% mortality at two years, 75% at five years. So it's very important to consider a more aggressive treatment when the patient already has a heart failure hospitalization. And the study rationale comes from the study that was also presented by Stefan, which, which tried to pull the patients who were treated with Carillon device in three different studies. And what was seen is that actually among those patients, there were patients with grade one plus and two plus. So they weren't all in three or four plus. And what was seen is that they did improve their quality of life, six minute working test, KCCQ, uh, and the volume of the regurgitation did improve, NYHA improved. And the survival rate was quite good. I mean, it's not a, there's no comparison, so we, we wouldn't know, but the survival is quite good. And what was also seen, and just to remember the pathophysiologies that we just discussed, if you look at the LV diameter, it did decrease with time, so there was a positive remodeling, and maybe with that, we have avoided a potential increase in the mitral regurgitation over time and a potential aggravation in uh, left ventricular function. So the design of the study is basically to have 300 patients, two steps, two time points in the study. First, 150 patients, 75 in each group, and then an interim analysis, adjustment of the sample size, and then another 75 patients. So this first analysis is when the people has already have 12 months follow-up, and then the other 300. And it's a win, a win model, and we have the hierarchication of the endpoints, where we have mortality, alternative therapy, including heart, failure, heart transplant or ELVAD, alternative therapy for the mitral, heart failure hospitalization, KCCQ, and six-minute walking tests. So the main inclusion criteria is to have symptomatic patient, under heart failure treatment, no CRT for the technical part, and then no other mitral repair devices that are over there. And then the core lab will check that we actually have the LV dysfunction and the LV dilation. So when we look at the design of the study, the first thing that occurs in mind is Potentially, the number of patients that we can include is huge. If we think about the criteria of most of the study with, that we are in, it's very difficult to find the patients because it's so restrictive. Here, it's very large. We have real data so far that have shown that potentially there's a benefit, and the question now is to prove that we can reverse the time course of the disease. And it's pretty innovative in my point of view. It could be a game changer. It, it might change the way we are looking about at mitral regurgitation and dilated cardiomyopathy, but we'll have to wait for the results. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you. F fantastic presentation and a fascinating concept because it's a completely new concept that we go away from treating just the MAR but um, trying to implement a preventive approach to prevent annular remodeling and thereby potentially atrial remodeling, ventricular remodeling and obviously also occurrence of, of, of a higher degree uh, mitral regurgitation. But you said it, I mean, the, the, the theoretical number of patients is almost unlimited. Maybe, maybe I, I, I'd like to ask Daniele, who do you think would be the ideal patient for, for such an approach? 
I think the best patient was the patient with a poor left ventricle ejection fraction and with a, 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 a dilata an annulus dilatation. He's the best patient, according to me. Because you have, to, you have a remodeling after you positioning or carry on. And uh, they, in the follow up, as you can see in my presentation, they have a better, better improvement of ejection fraction. So you would focus more on atrial remodeling rather than ventricular remodeling. Yes, okay. And then, Nicole, the, the, the baseline medication for that uh, trial, just, just remind us, um, what are the requirements again? I mean, we are still in the optimal medical therapy, but it will depend on the LV ejection fraction, but it will be quite wide. It was the optimal medical therapy. And Michael? Do yeah, we have, we have a question from the floor. Maybe we can try to address this. So the first is related to CRT, whether it's still possible or not. But I think we will see this in yeah. your presentation. So let's wait for that. And then co cord sparing replacement is the current guideline recommended surgical approach, mainly due to the risk of recurrence with annular palisty alone. Do you anticipate those patients as they progress in their primary disease that they will need a second intervention? Now, this is, I think, mo more related to primary uh, degenerative uh, MR, but maybe you can to try to address this I mean, still? Um, yeah, of course, it's more for primary, but what is, uh, what is already anticipated in the design of the study is that if a further intervention on the mitral is needed, then why not? And we've seen the combo, and why not? Maybe I would go, instead of the corridor sparing, maybe go for a tear inside a, uh, an annuloplasty. So why not? It's, it's accepted in the study. I mean, this is really a, a courageous um, study design, I have to say. It is, it is a forward thinking, it is trying to implement a, a sham controlled procedure, a sham controlled trial, which um, certainly is the gold standard. Um, there might be one limitation, and I, I wonder how you see that, Nicole. How sure can you be that um, if you implant such a device in your patient that the patient remains blinded for 12 months? Oh, it's very difficult. I also participated in the reduced MR study and the uh, reduced FMR study and what we've seen is that some of the patients at some point get an x-ray and mm. they realize or somebody tells them that actually they have it. So it's quite difficult. Mm. It's very, very difficult. So yeah, that's the, another limitation. We'll never have the perfect study, right? <laughs> But we, we have to try. We have to try. Um, another question from the audience? No, um, I think the, the question around the CRT um, we can address later. But um, my question, maybe I can also raise one point. Um, so the design of the study is that we also want to understand better at what time point in the disease condition we want to address this. I think this is critical and I would like to hear your opinion also. Is it in daily practice we always wait until we see severe regurgitation or severe symptoms NYHA 3 or 4? Um, do you think if we address this earlier we won't even see the progression to a severe heart failure in the future or I mean, what's your point? I guess we will... I I'm, I really recall the pathophysiology of the disease, and we know that once MR has started, it will continue, it will aggravate. So maybe what we, we are more sure to avoid is the aggravation of mitral regurgitation and those patients getting to MR3 and 4 with hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, TR. So uh, there's also what always happening behind. So this, I guess, there's a quite, we are quite sure of Avoiding it, I really, I do, I do think so. But uh, for the cardiomyopathy, there's an underlying mechanism also. So maybe we will slow it down. In some patient, maybe we can really slow it, really stop it. I don't think we can stop it really, if the, uh, depending on the underlying mechanism. But slowing down the disease could also be important. And just uh, one mention, there will be a stratification in the analysis according to the MR severity, and of course, this will bring some answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great discussion. Thank you again, Nicole. And, and now we move on and go to some Carillon experiences, some cases, um, and ask Daniele Folani to share with us his experience, please. Thank you to Cardia for the invitation and for the, uh, this uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> this is my conflict of interest. Which, which patient to treat? We had to treat a patient with uh, a mitral regurgitation, a functional mitral regurgitation with moderate to severe 
patients with insufficient co-optation of lifted, and patients with dilated annulus. Which patient we have not to treat, a patient with a degenerative disease of the vita valve, a severe annulus calcification, previous third implantation, and hemodynamic instability and severe impaired renal function. This is the carry-on uh, we have already seen. It's a big, like uh, one coin, one euro coin. We have a distal anchor and a proximal anchor and a, a transjugular device system and nine French. Uh, how does it work? On the left, we can see an animation. We kinking, we kinking the mitral annulus, and as you can see, we reduce the. Uh, with a reduction of the annulus, uh, and so uh, a good captation. In the middle, we, you can see the uh, dear heart, and uh, there is a no captation of the leaflet. Uh, after we have the uh, position, the, the, the carry-on, as you can see, with the arrow, the red arrows, we have a good captation, and the insufficiency is not uh, uh, visible. And on the right, yeah, we have a human heart. What we do in uh, our patient, uh, we have the red line, uh, the original annulus. And uh, after we put in our carry-on, we uh, restricted the, the uh, annulus, uh, and uh, we gain uh, better situation for the mitral valve. So, uh, which improvement we have to expect? In this uh, uh, paper published on ESC in 2021, we have a reduction of uh, uh, regurgitant fraction, uh, an improvement, uh, any reduction of uh, left, and left ventricle and diastolic volume and systolic volume, and an improvement of left ventricle ejection fraction. Uh, this brings to uh, a reduction near clax from 3-4 to 2-3 and a reduction of mitral regurgitation from 2, 3, or 4, and the most of all is at follow-up 1. So, uh, in Pescara, we start uh, this uh, registry, Pescami registry, Pescara Carion Mitral Insufficiency Registry. For March 2021, we evaluated six inpatients with mi functional mitral regurgitation. Uh, five patients, four male and one female, was eligible to uh, carry on, and this one was the uh, characteristic, a congestive heart failure, uh, functional severe mitral regurgitation, uh, symptomatic in optimal ter medical therapy, and clastinia 2 or 3. And this one was the echocardio data, uh, a severe dilatation of left ventricle, the severe reduction of a contracting function, a left atrium dilated, and this one was the uh, characteristic of mitral insufficiency, moderate to severe. The patient that I to present, want to present is a male, 53 years old, a core smoker, comes to our uh, hospital with acute congestive heart failure, and uh, uh, for the, we found a dilatative hypokinetic cardiomyopathy, a moderate severe mitral regurgitation. At the angio, we have some atherosclerosis on the left system with any uh, critical stenosis and uh, an occluded uh, RCA uh, not suitable for uh, revascularization. So uh, the patient, this one was the echo, uh, transthoracic echo, as you can see, uh, a poor ejection fraction and also a big regurgitation of the left or of mitral valve. Also the transesophageal echo confirmed the mitral regurgitation, as you can see in the video below. So the patient was eligible because he had a dilated ventricle, an anonymous dilatation, a vena contracta, a big vena contracta, and we performed, the, we are able to perform carry-on mitral contour system. So this one was a, the setup of the cat lab, an example, the maximum approach. We are on the left in our cat lab. We have two operators on the head of the patient to uh, maneuver the carry-on and release, an angiographer, a transesophageal, transthoracic echo, and uh, sometimes also the anesthesiology. And, uh, uh, but uh, we have also a minimum approach that uh, sometimes is our reality situation. So we, uh, from three operators, we became two operators, and one disappeared. Uh, sometimes we don't have the transesophageal or transthoracic echo, and sometimes we don't have the anesthesiology. So uh, also in this situation, we can uh, perform the procedure without any, any problem for the patient in, uh, in a good position. So, uh, let's see the case. Uh, this one was the sinus, the coronary sinus. Uh, we have the Judkins left uh, for the angio, the coronary angiography, and we uh, prepare a child in mother system, a guiding cutter for the device, uh, nine French, a multipurpose seven French, and the angiographic wire. So, we uh, put our uh, catheter on the coronary sinus, and then we uh, bring our uh, millimeter catheter because we have to uh, choice the device, and we have some uh, do some measurement for the patient. 
This one was what to do. We uh, decided the, the distal anchor zone, target zone, the proximal anchor zone, and we put the line on the, on the screen because when we have to release, we don't need, we don't, don't see anything. And uh, uh, so choose the distal and, and proximal anchor target zone. And what we want to do with not our device is this one, reduce the, the coronary sinus. And uh, uh, let's see what we do in this patient. We have to uh, put the first anchor, as you can see. Then uh, we lock it and we start to pull, uh, gentle pull the uh, entire system. As you can see, uh, there was a reduction on the middle. And then we release the second anchor. We lock the second anchor. At this point, uh, the system is, it is always retrievable. So we can take our time and we can see uh, the angio if there is some interaction with the circumflex or marginal branch, as you can see in the multiple projection. And then we see the uh, vital parameters, pressure, uh, EKG, uh, the, the symptoms of the patient. If we are confident, we can remove, we can leave the, uh, the, the device. This one was the uh, echo in the, in the in cat lab, and we see there is a, 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 a reduction an acute reduction of insufficiency. And then uh, we see the patient one month. Uh, if you remember how is the uh, ejection fraction, as you can see, there was a, a, um, an improvement of ejection fraction of this patient. Also for the uh, regurgitation, there was a reduction of regurgitation at one month, as you can see. So we start from this and you arrive at this at one month and the uh, pre-procedure system is uh, the vena contracta and also the uh, ejection fraction. This one was the measurement. The uh, left ventricle and the volume 81 and left ventricle and the volume 340 millimeter. And this one was the measure of the, the, the annulus. At one month, at 12 months, we are this situation with this reduction from 81 to 50, uh, from 340 uh, to 150. So a, a great result, according to us. My conclusion, uh, it was an easy and rapid procedure, about 40 meters, uh, uh, minutes, uh, with jugular right approach without tra transeptal puncture. It does not preclude subsequent therapeutic interventions. General anesthesia is not mandatory. The transesophageal or 3D is not mandatory. The procedure was compatible with patient anatomy and the device can be recovered. The anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy is not mandatory and also cardiac surgery is not mandatory. The conclusion of Pesca Mirage is a short registry with only five <laughs> patients. So uh, I, have, uh, I have a passion of uh, fishing mm -hmm. and um, we have an improvement of symptoms, uh, exercise capability, uh, near class reduction one point, contract function, and a reduction of left ventricular dimension, and also reduction of mitral regurgitation till mid moderate. This brings to no further hospitalization for heart failure. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for, for, for the cases and for your presentation. Just a um, couple of quick questions for clarification. The amount for, of sh foreshortening is, is always the same, right? It's not some, something which is adapted, right? Um, is there anything you would measure beforehand in terms of the diameters or the, 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 um, um, the annular, um, um, the, the circumferential um, um, dimensions to predict the response? Is that something we can do these days already to be a little bit better in predicting what we will end up with? The more we can uh, retrieve, the more we can uh, reduce the, the carry-on, the more we have benefits. Sometimes uh, some patients have a, a short, a short uh, coronary sinus, so we cannot uh, uh, perform a, a, a good retraction of the, uh, with the device. So we have to show a, a, a mild reduction. And uh, also the results uh, not can be uh, perfect. But uh, I think that the combo therapy in this patient can be the optimum because you can uh, try with the carry-on. If you have a reduction, if you have an improvement left ventricle, you can uh, avoid to use uh, a tear. Or if you can combine the surgery, uh, combine the hanuloplasty and uh, uh, point of affieri. Okay. What, what sort of coronary sinus anatomy you, you're looking for and in, in which anatomy would you not be able to implant it? Uh, when we have uh, uh, not an alignment of uh, coronary sinus uh, to uh, the uh, mitral, mitral valve. 
If you have an alignment uh, with this, uh, that you can see better with, uh, uh, coronary, uh, the, with uh, tomography. And uh, we can also see sometimes with the echo, if you have a non-restricted uh, um, connection between the coronary sinus and the mitral annulus, uh, yeah. you cannot have good, good result. But also if you have a displacement, a little displacement, you can also retrieve, uh, you can also uh, have a good result with uh, uh, reduction. Yeah, as you said, there are three possibilities. So one is to use a TOE. You can easily identify the coronary sinus, and typically the coronary sinus is atrial to the hinge point of the leaflets. You can do a coronary angio with a run-through uh, venous angiogram, and you simply do a two-chamber view, an REO, um, REO 20, REO 30, and then you will also see the height of the uh, coronary sinus in comparison of your posterior branch of the circumflex artery, or you can do a CT. So these three possibilities are there to identify that you're close to the real hinge points, and this improves uh, the reduction of annulus and MR. Nicole? Yeah, I said just one small question. Uh, for me, one of the advantages of Carillon system is that you can implant it in quite a lot of patients, and in your study you, said, you mentioned that you only included 5 out of 16. Yeah. Did I, why is that? I mean, for me it's... Uh, we, we start uh, in, the, in the first moment, uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, dubbed uh, at the beginning because we don't need, don't know the, the procedure very well. So at the start we start uh, very very slowly, and uh, we are uh, we want to choose the right patient because if you choose the right patient, we have good result. If you choose not the right patient, you have nice result. So at the beginning we want to start uh, very very slowly. So we have this result. I believe that uh, we can improve. We can improve our uh, our uh, enrollment. Patient selection is always the key for success. I have a last question for you, for the audience. Um, the question is, do you think that in five years' time from now, analoplasty will play a greater role either for prevention or treatment of MR than, in, than it does today? So if you think that the adoption and interest in analoplasty to prevent or treat MR will increase, then please raise your hands. So that might be the result of this session. Not bad. Thank you very much. Thanks to the speakers. And then I will hand over to Michael to conclude the session. Yeah, I'm, maybe we, ha we have two or three minutes left. We can answer the remaining questions. Um, have you noticed the mean gradient to be an issue that limits how much annulopathy you can perform with this procedure, similar to like tear? Do you, do you look at the gradient, or is this not a limitation? No, according to it's not a limitation. Okay, no. wonderful. And then the last question, we've partly answered the CRT lead question. So if this is an exclusion criteria, you've put clearly shown? If you, if you have a, a, a before implantation uh, or a, 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 a CRT, it's an exclusion criteria. But uh, in my cat lab, I speak with electrophysiology, and we want to try uh, the... Uh, the bundle branch uh, uh, stimulation, an adult stimulation, so the, um, the ease stimulation. So if you put the, 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 the pacemaker, the, the electrode in the septal, you can uh, uh, avoid to put a, a catheter in the coronary sinus, and then you can perform. If uh, it doesn't work, you can perform uh, the carry-on. Yeah. Actually, you can do CRT after Carillion. So, yeah. so if you wait just one month, you let it heal in, uh, the system is open. So you can still yeah, yeah. penetrate the coronary sinus. It's not a reducer system. Yeah. Uh, it is a completely open system, and the anchors are penetrating to the wall. So it's very easy to identify it, actually, <laughs> for the electrophysiologist where to go in yeah. and where to have the individual left ventricular branch. Uh, so it is possible after, but it's not possible before, because otherwise the Carillion device would slip. Uh, that's, that's the situation. And perhaps for the reduction, because you answer, uh, asked it, uh, Philip, there are three different lengths of the system. So typically, you will see 12 centimeter to 13 centimeter or 14 centimeter absolute length. And you can reduce it to a preset distance, which is a length of 6 centimeters, 7 or 8 centimeters. And this will be the final length. So you measure the original coronary sinus length, and then you decide how to reduce this. And this is typically done by 5 centimeters is four to five centimeters reduction, and you choose out of three different final lengths. So you don't, uh, you don't have a reduction system, you calculate the difference. Yeah. Important. 
All right. So then it brings me to the conclusion. I think we have seen an important technology. There's a question. Sorry, it's hard to see <laughs> with the lights on. Can we turn off the uh, turn on the mic? Yeah. I think it's on now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, one final question: In a patient with the left bundle branch block, CRT indication and a significant MR. Now the guidelines tell us we have to do CRT. What would you, your take on that be? Should we first do a Carillion weight and then CRT? Yep. Yeah. Yes, but for this point uh, we have a problem because because we we have to put the CRT. But if we put the CRT, it doesn't work. We cannot do carry-on. So, uh, as uh, uh, Professor said, you can put carry-on, and if you resolve the, the, the mitral insufficiency, you have not the need to uh, second uh, CRT. If you have, uh, you, you can to do this uh, after the carry-on, or if you you can uh, do a stimulation of uh, is stimulation. That, yeah, uh, yeah. Left uh, so we have to conclude. Yeah. Uh, only very short question, please. We okay, have just a comment. If yeah. the CRT is implanted and it doesn't work for three or four months, you can pull out the LV lead and do the carry on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, so I want to conclude. We have seen a good alternative technology that is simplistic in such that the procedure is very easy to be performed and it allows for additional future procedures, which is critically important. With that, I would like to conclude and wish you a very remaining pleasant Congress. Thank you very much.